had a, a funny career in that I was nursing during the war, training, hurt my back and had to stop and became a medical social worker. And during the time as a social worker, I realized how much a patient was part of his whole family and how important home was. But in the first ward I took over, there was a Polish Jew of 40 years who had an inoperable cancer. I was virtually his only visitor for the two months that he was there before he died. And we talked together about somewhere that would have helped him rather better than the very busy surgical ward where he was because he both needed better symptom control, although he didn't have a particularly severe pain problem. But most of all, he needed to sort out who he was, dying at the age of 40 and coming from the Warsaw Ghetto, of course, leaving nobody behind and feeling he'd made no impression on the world for ever having lived in it. Um, but as we were talking, he said um, he would leave me something in his will. He had an insurance. And he said, I'll be a window in your home. And the idea of openness to everybody who might come, um, openness to every future challenge really stems from that gift, which was, I think, the founding gift of the whole hospice movement, made by David Tasma, who thought his name would never mean anything to anybody. That was really the founding. It just, Christmas didn't have a name. The home was just a dream, a castle in the air. I immediately started going as a nurse volunteer in the evenings to one of the early homes to which I had been sending dying patients as their social worker. And it was there that I found the regular giving of oral morphine balanced to the patient's need, given regularly on a four-hour basis, and giving patients much better pain control than I'd ever seen before in my years as a nurse or in, in hospital, where people had to earn their morphine by having pain first. But here, it was constant control of a constant pain. And I realized that this was a terribly important discovery, which was really obvious in many ways, but simply wasn't being used because there were the two big fears that if you started um, pain-killing drugs too soon, they would lose their effect when you really needed them. And also that patients would become drug dependent. And instead of the pressure of pain, it would be the pressure of longing for the drug. And those were sort of two myths that, that needed to be dealt with. And after I'd been as a volunteer for about three years, I said to the surgeon I was working for, I'll have to go back and nurse somehow. I must get to these people. And it was he who said, go and read medicine. It's the doctors who desert the dying. And there's so much more to be learned about pain, and you'll only be frustrated if you don't do it properly, and they won't listen to you. So I started medical school at the age of 33, not having done science before, with the idea of doing something about pain. I think that those two old myths of drug dependence and tolerance have still not really been dealt with um, in spite of all the proofs that we now have, the studies that have been made, they haven't got across. And I think a major reason is because medical students in a teaching hospital largely see acute pain, post-operative, post-trauma, post-burn, whatever. Um, and acute pain is an event and it's got a built-in meaning. But of course, Patients dying of cancer and other diseases as well have a chronic pain, a continual pain, and to treat it as if it's an acute an event, when it's really a situation in which the patient is held, is completely illogical. You need to give your drugs regularly, you need to give them balance to the patient, there's no standard dose, and you need to be alert to the whole person who has the sort of total pain that I recognized when I started in St. Joseph's and described back in the early 60s as total pain with its physical, psychological, 
social and spiritual components, a whole experience for the patient. I think it's isolation that people fear most of all when they're dying. It's becoming less than a person. Um, it's not so uh, still being Mr. A or Mrs. B, who is part of a family, has had a job, has their responsibilities, their role in the world. I think people fear pain, but they, even more than that, they fear dependence, not being in control of what is happening. And I think that palliative care it aims to give the patient as much control as they can have in the rest of their lives by covering as much as you can of the pain and the other symptoms and leaving them the freedom to go on being themselves. And I think a physician in his training is made to look very much at, at systems and symptoms and ways of coping with them and less at the patient as a whole person. One is brought up to diagnose and to deal with and hopefully to cure. And it seems to get forgotten that 100% of our patients are in fact going to die eventually. So often you meet patients who still say that a doctor has said there is nothing more I can do. And we don't like staying in situations in which we feel there is nothing to do. There is a body of knowledge. There is plenty to do. When we look at the whole spectrum of the needs that a person as part of his family or her family may have at the end of life, we can be very daunted and feel, I can't possibly cope with that. I'm, I'm a simple doctor. I, I know how to deal with physical things, and that's what I should be doing. But we're not here on our own. We should be very much part of a team, the nurses, the physiotherapists. Everybody who is involved with this patient is, is part of the team. And to be able to share is enormously important in this work. If you think um, it's only I who understand this patient and can deal with it, that's a dangerous position to be in. And it may not only be the patient, it may be the family. It may be the child of the family that needs to ask the question of the doctor. Um, and it's very important that when we're thinking of the whole family, we don't leave the children out because it may make a big difference to the whole of the rest of their lives, how they handle the death of a parent or a grandparent or a sibling. I think the physician has to, to look at his own sense of meaning of life, and that has to be an involvement at the real depth of what it means to be human. What we're looking at I think is the whole area of spirituality, which is much wider than a purely religious practice. It is, I think, the search for meaning, the look at one's own most important values, the feeling of looking beyond yourself and of, of somehow belonging to something more than you are, be it maybe only your own family network. But there is something about knowing who you are and looking back on your life and coming to terms with it and being able to lay it down with some degree of quietness, which I think is much deeper than just psychological, and it's something to which I would give the title spiritual. And I think that is part of man. And to leave that on one side and only look at the body and the physical side is to shortchange people. People are more important than just that. Um, and even if you think they leave nothing behind themselves, um, but the memories of those who knew them, it's very important that they should be good memories. I'm often asked, what is the, the first thing you really want to say to somebody going into medicine or moving into palliative care? What is the major commitment? And I'm sure the answer is simply listen to your patients. They'll tell you. They'll tell you what they need. They'll tell you who they are and what they can achieve. I think a lot of people over the years have gone into medicine um, and have perhaps felt hesitant at saying at their interview, I want to help people, because it may sound sentimental. But actually, the, the drive is to make bad things better. It's not new. 
what we're doing. We're picking up a lot of things which are our inheritance. There aren't too many original ideas in the world. You pick up one thing here, another there, pain control here, home care. It's like putting it into a kaleidoscope and you give it a shake and it comes down in the new pattern. But it's things that are part of being human and part of being a professional, part of just being a person.